Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 9, COVID-19 as a Lesson in Humility, with Gilbert Mercier. Gilbert Mercier is a French journalist, photojournalist, and filmmaker. He founded the News Junkie Post in 2009 and is its co-editor-in-chief. Over the years, he has been a guest analyst on television and radio programs for RT, BBC World News, the Progressive Radio Network, Sputnik, al Hara TV, Counterpunch Radio, and Radio Islam. Massier's articles have been republished by Alternet, Truthout, Counterpunch, Z Communications, Signs of the Times, Popular Resistance, and others. He is a member of the National Press Photographers Association and the Art Directors Guild of America. Gilbert and I spoke on May 5th and covered a variety of political and environmental topics, many of them in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Hello, Gilbert. Thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking some time to talk to me today. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, to join you, uh, Colibri. It's, uh, you know, I've been uh, actually... Uh, uh, checking out your work for quite some time, and I, you know, I always find your your uh, your writing very interesting. And 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 recently, you you wrote a comment on a on a social media about some article that I that I wrote about the uh, uh, the you know the the white supremacist uh, evangelical. Uh, and so on and so on, and uh, I, I didn't realize that you you actually grew up in that milieu. Yes, I didn't grow up in an evangelical milieu uh, um, specifically. I grew up in a Catholic background. However, the state that I grew up in was Nebraska, which is a deep red state, and... Uh, very conservative, and I went to my, the schools I went to were were religious schools. Well, that it, it's I, I you know I'm I'm not doing an interview of you, but I, I, it, it would be it would be very interesting to know how, how you managed to uh, to get to the other end of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the long story short is that I got out of Nebraska as soon as I could you know, and got to um, a coast because uh, in the United States, mostly that's what you want to do is get to a coast. (laughs) Ah, I see. I see. Well, I used to live on one of the coasts. I actually, I used to live in, in the, in one of the left coast, uh, uh, which is uh, specifically California and Los Angeles. For for most of the time I've lived in the U S Yes, I, I really like California myself personally. Yeah, I, I've uh, I spent a lot. I spent most of the last five years in California uh, working on the um, cannabis farms out there. That that's very intriguing. <laughs> yeah, well, the, 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 there's lots of stories we could tell. Maybe sometime we can get together over a bottle of wine and talk about those things. <laughs> well, yeah, if we could actually could get together today, and I was mentioning that the other day to you, to to you by by a, a direct message, you know, because it's. Cinco de Mayo, which uh, uh, I, I, I would say is is actually maybe people, it's the Mexican national holiday, but maybe a lot of people do not realize what it is. Uh, uh, Mexico used to be part of the the little French empire of Napoleon the Third, the nephew of of, of Napoleon the First. Well, Napoleon Bonaparte. And on Cinco de Mayo is when the Me- Mexican beat and kicked the French out of Mexico, which was, by the way, well deserved. So I think that if, if you and I we were together, I think what I would suggest in, to celebrate, you know, Cinco de Mayo 
and also to kind of celebrate in a way the the well, even so there's no no reason to celebrate per se, but have a corona which happened to be a Mexican beer. <laughs> You're right, that would be very appropriate today, wouldn't it? <laughs> That would be absurd, but you see, I, you know, I'm, uh, that that's kind of the that that's kind of the way uh, from time to time. Because you see, Kuriboy, uh, to me, you people people are, are losing their sense of humor with this uh, this pandemic, and 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 it is a tragedy. Yes, it's a tragedy, but it's not the first tragedy, or unfortunately, the last that that my, mankind will will go through, but. We need to still sort of maintain some sort of 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 humor and and more deeply than that philosophically uh, uh, Calibri, I feel like if you have no you know uh, uh, basically the humor to me okay is to be able to laugh at tragedy and at, at, at really, really bad situation. Uh, that's, that to me is, is kind of a dark comedy, if you wish. But the thing is, if you, if you are afraid of death, okay, uh, more than anything else, it's not really living. Living should be the appreciation of life with the full knowledge that it is um, something that is very, very fragile. That is, uh, uh, I mean, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm a non-believer. I'm agnostic. So, so it's certainly not not a divine gift. But let's say it's a it's a gift nonetheless. And and if you are not in in the frame of mind to uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, cherish. Uh, those kind of instant, then you don't understand anything. I mean, before we went on air, we were talking about, um, you know, native, uh, indigenous Native Americans. And indigenous population are, are, are remarkable in the sense that they are the most, probably they were the most anti-capitalist, and closest to nature population in the world with animists in 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 Africa. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, they had no sense of personal property. Okay, every everything, all, all the land, everything, all the stuff they had, besides just very very like personal weapon or, or, or tent or, or, or whatnot, but certainly no land. They, they didn't have the sense and the notion uh, 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 that land belonged to human. And, and they had this, this incredible closeness to, to, uh, to nature that, of course, you know, the, the uh, arrival of Christopher Columbus in the Americas in actually what what became Haiti uh, at first sort of completely ruined. Uh, uh, in my opinion, they, they, the, this sense of um, first of all, the, the capitalism rests on exploitation, exploitation of the land, exploitation of resources, and exploitation of people, and that's exactly the opposite of the uh, of the sort of philosophy and way of living of, of uh, uh, indigenous population. Indigenous population, more or less worldwide. Right. Now, I've given this a lot of thought, what you're talking about, and I, I actually wrote a book, uh, or put a collection of essays together called The Failures of Farming and the Necessity of Wild Tending, with wild tending being a term which describes um, – for want of a better word, land management practices by indigenous populations, right? And so I, I have done some reading into what you, you've talked about, about the lack of property, about the exploitation, etc. And I feel like there's a big jump from those original lifestyles to capitalism, and that in between, 
those two, you have the agricultural revolution, with that being problematic, first and foremost, uh, preceding capitalism and capitalism being a drastic ramping up of basically everything that was wrong with that new lifestyle. Oh, completely. Uh, Calibri, I completely agree with you. And in terms of in terms of exploitation before capitalism, uh, uh, we had we had uh, feudalism in in uh, in uh, uh, in Europe and, and and also a bunch of empire like like the Roman Empire, for example. Yeah, of course, it's uh, it's uh, they, they were like precursor of of of, of this and and uh, in terms of of human exploitation. However. In terms of uh, the, the 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 real problem, the the real problem beside what what I've noted about about the colonization colonization of, of 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 the America and and the nice little uh, add-on which was actually essential of of slavery because without slavery the the a capitalist wet dream. Is 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 of course slavery because la- labor then is not even cheap. Labor is free. Not only is free, but they can be a uh, uh, slave could be bought and sold like cattle. Okay, so this is this is perfect. This is actually what it is in in essence, and this is why anybody that defends capitalism is somebody that has never thought out in terms of ethics and moral imperative. Yes, absolutely. I, I definitely agree with that. And we now are at a point, uh, there's been other points, but we're at a point now with this pandemic where capitalism is is facing a, a, a crisis and is is facing a perhaps an existential crisis but to me to me this is excellent and it's precisely an opportunity for people like you and i and and a bunch of of other people worldwide to uh, uh, to seize in terms of res res the conscientious level level of the population because this is the problem here the the problem is Middle class, middle class in Europe, middle class in in countries that are are supposed to be, you know, countries that do well, like the U.S. But what people do not realize in Europe, okay, I've been living here since the early 80s. So I've been living in, in the U.S. for a very, very long time. And I've been living everywhere in the U.S. What they don't realize in Europe is that Within, and I've said it a few times, within the U.S., and once again it's revealed by the the COVID-19 pandemic because of the level of victim, Uh, there is, and of course it's from slavery, from that nice little history of slavery, there is a third world country within what is supposed to be the the number one uh, uh, power in the world, which is only number one power of in the world because of imperium and because of its uh, military, basically. So what we need to do, we need to do some serious thinking here. Okay, uh, capitalist right that right now to me is the 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 economy is completely shut. It only is it's only surviving because there were massive uh, injection of money that doesn't exist, money that is printed, money that is not backed on anything, or on gold. Traditionally, money uh, was backed, had to be backed, currency had to be backed by uh, um, uh, gold, okay? Uh, somebody like Ron Paul uh, is still, you know, in its sort of dinosaur universe, is still pleading that it should be backed on, on gold. Uh, however, so uh, since the, the beginning of the crisis, and people need to be aware of that, uh, we are, the U.S. is in the hole, another, uh, I believe it's now, it's going to be $6 trillion, 
to be added on to what was already $22 trillion. Now, that's some serious money. Okay? Uh, and it's, it's going the same way. China is doing the same thing. Japan is doing the same thing. And Europe just announced today that they're going to go uh, up to the tune of 2 trillion euros. Okay? That is a lot of money. And it's money that's not there. What they are hoping, okay, the, the people that, in my mind, work for the billionaire class, what I call the billionaire class, and they're very specific people, okay? The list is given every year by Forbes and Fortune magazine. Right now, maybe it has changed. Maybe some of them have lost some of their money. It's 2,019 people worldwide, okay? So those are the people that are holding 60% of the wealth of humanity, okay? So people that feel, people in the middle class or slightly upper middle class that have, have unfortunately for them, their retirement on the stock market, 401k, and there's countries that are actually a pension plan on the stock market, like the UK, Canada, and other countries, uh, they are going to be the victim. But they still think, they still think that it's a good system. No, why? It's completely irrational, Colibri. It is completely irrational. And so what you're talking about is, it sounds like you've described just now sort of three different uh, classes to me. The billionaire class, the middle class, maybe this would also be the managerial class. And then you talked about a third world within the U.S. So uh, that would be another class. Am I kind of getting you right there? Yeah, absolutely. But but you see, the thing is, that third class, there is, of course, as always in the U.S., and you know that because you're Americans, there is always the color divide. Okay. Even so, this country had, had a president, uh, a black president for eight years, but it's still a racist country. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to give you an example. Okay. In 2016, okay, uh, I witnessed a little conversation between uh, uh, your typical hillbilly redneck in the, in the Trumpistan part of the country where I live. Uh, at the moment. And the conversation was as follows. They were laughing. Uh, and, and um, well, and they say, well, of course, you know, we wouldn't want uh, uh, that, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, and they use a B word for Hillary Clinton uh, uh, to win. But at least we, we will not have an N word president in the White House. Anymore, and they thought it was hilarious. Okay, uh, so uh, this country is still racist, but however, uh, there's a lot of very, very poor white folks, uh, very poor white folks that, in order to to make ends meet, they have to have two or three uh, uh, minimum wage uh, job. See, to me, it, it, it's really it's a subterfuge. Okay. Uh, uh, to me, there's a lot more in common between uh, uh, Barack Obama, uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey, and let's say, of course, not at the same level of wealth, and, and Jeff Bezos, than, than between um, uh, uh, the people that I've named and, and ordinary people, ordinary people in terms of wealth. The real divide is really wealth. It's really a capitalist divide. Okay, which is why, uh, uh, I mean, look, th there's something very stale, unfortunately, about, about Marxism. But there's something, I'm talking about Karl Marx himself, but there's something extremely valid in, in, a, in a socialist approach of things in, in terms of, of, of uh, you know, social organization. And, and um, which has to be, of course, uh, uh, organized in the context of the other factor that we have on our hand, which is not the factor of social 
inequality, but the factor of the climate crisis, which is still very much, uh, uh, very much around. April was the warmest uh, uh, month of April on, on record worldwide. So guess what? The ice caps are still melting. It's, we, 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 we have that COVID crisis, but that's only one aspect of things. So to me, what is very valuable about this COVID-19 COVID, uh, uh, problem and, and the lockdown, it gives time, it gives people time to reflect. It gives time to people to reflect on the way they want their life to, to go, uh, the way, the, uh, the, the kind of world that their children might have uh, um, uh, to deal with. And, and it's, it's very, very interesting, and hopefully, hopefully some, some good thing will come out of it. Right. I, I think about this partly in terms of, for example, the physical equipment of our system, too. So like an oil well is not something that you can just shut down and then start up again. If you shut an oil well down, it might not be able to get started again. That's just how these things work. And so it strikes me that the longer that our system is uh, down or disabled, at least partially, uh, the less of a chance there is that it's going to be able to uh, start fully up again. And that would be good news. Oh, absolutely. And you, you're talking about the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the metaphor of, of the oil well. Absolutely. Uh, um, the thing is, you know, uh, uh, oil has become more or less worthless as, as a commodity. Um, and uh, uh, maybe it's time for people to realize that the oil in question should be left uh, underground where it belongs. You see, and 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 that's the all the corn, all the monoculture situation, all the corn that is is used to 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 add to uh, to um, to to gas to to uh, to make ethanol with gas, if you wish. That also should be uh, we should call polyculture, which is which is obviously the way to go. It always has been the way to go, you know. Uh, but again. Things have become again the, the 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 origin the well the massive origin of a problem is uh, the mid uh, uh, 1900 around you know 18, 1848 1850 which is the start of the industrial revolution and that got capitalism going at a speed that has been so destructive that it's it has not, and, and the, 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 the few revolution, revolution, I'm talking about La Commune in France in 1870, which unfortunately didn't work. That was a good one. I'm talking about, uh, of course, the, the Russian Revolution, the Cuban and the Chinese Revolution. That didn't work either. Let's face it, okay? Uh, and that's going to upset a lot of your listeners uh, maybe, but I don't really care because I'm not a dogmatic person. China is not a communist country. They pretend to be communists. They do, they do not, I know communists, I know Marxists. They do not apply any of the principle of communism. None of them. It's some of some of hybrid system uh, using communist organization and Marxist organization for capitalist purpose, okay? Uh, of course, Russia is not, the, Russia has gone, uh, well, kind of a state capitalism, uh, but in, in a real way, you know? So what, what do we have left in terms of communist country? Well, we have little Cuba, but even, even Cuba without Fidel Castro, well, it's probably going to get diluted. You know, and 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 let, let take take also an, another another great country, another promising revolution, and somebody that that 
that managed to to build not only the the French Empire but the the also the U.S. Empire, which is Ho Chi Minh in in um, in Vietnam. Uh, well, can you imagine what Ho Chi Minh would think right now to see his country, the country that that three million Vietnamese died in that war against the American alone, to turn into some kind of sweatshop of the U.S. and some kind of uh, sort of like small capitalist enterprise? I mean, it, 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 it's just, you know, right now, as I said. In terms of model, uh, unfortunately, and I'm saying that, uh, you know, I, I really mean it. Unfortunately, uh, uh, that has failed, but it doesn't mean that the ideals are gone. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. And I want to read a on that subject, I want to read a quick sentence out of one of your recent essays here. Uh, you, you wrote, The COVID-19 Great Depression upon us might be capitalism's endgame and the birth of a new global eco-socialist era based on social equality, real democracy with sound governance, zero economic growth, zero global military spending, and respectful harmony with what is left of the natural world. Well, exactly. You know, Colibri, this this is meant. You know, uh, I'm I'm not I'm not an ideologue, okay. Uh, but this is meant in a way to be some sort of outline for what could be an eco social, a global eco socialist manifesto, providing that I would write it. You know, uh, uh, and and I think that what it should be, yeah, it probably should be written, but it should be a collaborative piece uh, uh, because also it's kind of like it's always like the kind of oh me 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 you know I'm a great thinker you know it's like the the uh, the um, the the Noam Chomsky or the the Naomi Klein of the world you know the great thinker of the left which are actually not really on the left. Because when you talk about, uh, uh, for example, the Green New Deal, okay, the Green New New Deal is completely bogus. It rests on it. It mimics the New Deal uh, 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 of World War Two, uh, and FDR certainly was no socialist. And it's also it kind of echo the absurdity of Jeremy Corbyn that is supposed to be a Marxist, but he's not, when he talk about uh, the green industrial revolution. Now, talk about an oxymoron to, to talk about the green industrial revolution, uh, because it cannot be industrial, okay? So, what we need, we need to have, okay, uh, and I'll tell you, France right now, curiously enough, has been sort of split in between, um, in France there's département, okay, which are basically uh, sort of like the small region, all, all that stuff was set up by Napoleon Bonaparte, okay. They, they, and right now, you have the, the red département and the green département. Uh, uh, strangely enough, the red department coincide pretty much with, with with what was occupied France during World War II. Okay, but that joke aside, what we need to have in our little revolution here, and it needs to be a global movement. It really needs to be global. And I'm not. I'm also not talking about following in the footsteps of the the John of Arc of, of what's supposed to be a, a climate issue, which is Greta Thunberg, of course, uh, because that's also, uh, uh, it's somebody that, that has been completely fully co-opted, okay? I'm talking about a combination of red as socialism and green as ecological movement as a real green movement. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, but but those, those principles are, are really simple, and as a matter of fact, 
uh, uh, you know, the motto of the French Revolution, and that was in 1789, was, and still is, it's still the motto of the Republic, even so, you know, they don't necessarily behave, I'm talking about the government, the way it was set, it's liberté, égalité, fraternité, which is very easy to understand in English, which is liberty, equality, and, and brotherhood. And, and to me, those three principles are completely valid. Yes, absolutely. I think that that's, that would have to be at the heart of however it is that we move forward. And it seems as though those values are, I would dare to say, uh, instinctual to humans, too. Oh, completely. But, but, but the, the thing is, you know, the way people, the way governments are reacting to this crisis it is, is very, uh, um, it is very, very disturbing because they, there's the aspect, all this, uh, uh, social distancing thing, uh, uh not uh, having to wear a mask in, 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 um, in, uh, outside in, in, in public. I mean, it's basically, it's almost like, um, uh, I would say, you know, I wrote, I wrote a book a few years ago called The Orwellian Empire in 2015, but it's almost, it's so Orwellian that it's almost like, um, how should I put it, like a secular Sharia law, okay? Uh, where, well, it's not really burqa for women, like in, like in Afghanistan or, or Saudi Arabia, but it's, hey, everybody has to wear, has to cover their face, to cover their nose and, and their mouth. Okay, uh, and everybody has to be six feet apart, you know. Uh, and it's like, okay, why? Uh, why can't everybody get tested, for for example? Why can't we actually divest in the, in all the military in the world and invest in healthcare and give free free healthcare for all? Why can't we invest money in education, not only? Uh, you know, uh, uh, high school level education, but university education, free, like it is still in France. Okay? Uh, why can't we do that? Right. Well, I think we the military do. you mentioned is the biggest, that in the United States anyway, that's the, the largest expense on our books that really prevents us from doing anything else sensible. Uh, it sucks away about... Between between the Pentagon per se and and the and the the hidden budget of the of the CIA and the like, it sucks away one trillion a year. That's what it sucks away. But yeah, the U.S. is barely alone. Uh, Russia Russia is bad. China is 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 getting there. It's bad everywhere. Uh, uh, Colibri. I mean, it's really bad. And 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 it's not only. It's it's been money, and it's it's also the sector of weapon manufacturing. Okay, uh, basically, what does get manufactured in the U.S. Uh, weapon system, uh, and um, and what else? Oh oh, some poison like uh, Roundup. Okay, uh, that's what get manufactured in the U.S. All right, the other stuff that is manufactured that profit U.S. companies such as uh, uh, um, Apple and so on and so on. All that stuff is manufactured where labor costs less, China, Vietnam, India. And that is the problem with globalization and global capitalism. But the good news is right now, COVID-19 has put a really nasty wrench into this. Yes, it certainly has. And I've been watching it with some anticipation, uh, even some hopeful uh, anticipation. Uh, although I also have been seeing, it strikes me, a lot of people being distracted or led astray by various narratives and stories and claims that all seem to be serving the purpose of keeping people from looking at things in a practical way and of taking advantage of this moment. I mean, if, if we could return for just one moment to the 
masks and the social distancing that you mentioned just for one moment. Now, in the absence of good governance, in the absence of uh, testing, in the absence of all these things that we should be doing, it strikes me that having masks and social distancing is a common sense thing to do because it's the only thing that's available to us right now. Yeah, yes, it is, Colibri, but it also has the, the, the nasty little side effect, and I'm talking about specifically for France, to keep, uh, we, we are very keen on, on dissent and protest, to keep all those people who, who dissent and protest uh, uh, locked up in the in their home, have have the cops, have the the, the military, the cops and the gendarmes that patrol the the street, which is not the case in the U.S. You don't have that in the U.S. Uh, and uh, uh, giving fine and uh, and and to rule by decree. Okay, so that is not very good. And I'm telling you, I do not support at all the people that are getting played by getting played by by Trump and and the like of Alex Jones. Okay, I do not support those people here. Uh, those people are, are uh, they cannot be defined in any way, shape, or form. Okay, uh, and that come also from uh, it come from two things. What they want is this: to them, uh, life. Uh, people that will, will die from that will be called collateral damage, uh, just like they used to call, just like Kissinger used to call the people killed in his little war uh, that he supervised in, in Vietnam, collateral damage, okay, of the economy, because the god of those people is Wall Street and the economy. So if they can save their financial market and their uh, economy, basically their money, then they don't care about anything else. And they use various community, like, you know, uh, sort of, I would say, fairly simple-minded co community, like the evangelical, for example, and, and the like, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to share that up. But those people, you know, I mean, I mentioned that in, in one of my articles, the, the current Secretary of Education in the Trump administration, her name is Betsy Davos, she's a billionaire. Uh, um, incidentally, a, a, brother, a brother's name is Eric Prince, he's, he's the, the founder and head of Blackwater, who know us change his name, and the woman, just like Mike Pence, is a raving lunatic creationist who th those people believe that the uh, dinosaurs 6,000 years ago were running around in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Now, those people should not be in government. They used to be, they were always around in, in the, the, this weird milieu, but they used to be sort of like underground, you know, uh, they're not anymore. They are in the open. Yes, it's been shocking to see them come out of the open, into the open. And uh, some of us have looked at the situation. And when people have said, oh, we have to get rid of, you know, we have to impeach Trump. Our first thought was, well, wait a minute. That would mean Pence. And I don't know if he's any better than Trump at all. And perhaps he's worse. Look, I, I, I have, I have a, 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 a strange standpoint on U.S. politics. I've been around for a long time, uh, uh, Colibri, and, and personally, the way I see it, to me, this is not, there, there's only one party in America, okay? Only one. Uh, uh, you can call it a Republican, you can call it whatever you want. There's only one party. They always serve, they serve only the same interest, okay? There were no issue in Congress, okay? And Congress, not the Senate, Congress is controlled by uh, uh, people that are supposed to be Democrat and caring about people, okay? They have, they have several things in common. Most of them are millionaires, okay? Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, almost all of them. And they always go for Wall Street and the banks. They never have any problem 
taking money from the taxpayer to give it to the tune of trillion to salvage what they care about, the economy and the banks and Wall Street and big corporations. This is what they do, okay? So people should not be uh, uh, hoping that, let's say, if Joe Biden gets elected, uh, it's going to change anything. You know, uh, a very long time ago, I believe, I don't know, I think it was in 2012, I wrote an article, and I think at the time it was between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. Oh, yeah, that's right. And I wrote a, a commentary. It was called, it was it's very sarcastic, needless to say. It was called uh, uh, Obama versus Romney. It, it, it's like deciding between, between uh, uh, Pepsi and Coke. Okay? But unfortunately... That's what it is, uh, Colibri. That is really what it is. Yeah, it's it's two sides of the same coin. And I think that this year, the differences or lack of differences, I should say, between the two candidates are more prominent than they've ever been. It's very difficult to find any gap at all but between the between the two of them. And so I'm I'm hoping that more people will will not be able to deny the, the, the reality of that. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... I wanted to jump back to civil liberties for a moment because I, I know you've put a lot of thought into this subject. So when it, comes to the, when it comes to the pandemic and civil liberties, how is it that we navigate this tricky situation? Because... Obviously, we have assaults on civil liberties going on around the world. And yet, at the same time, there are common sense things that we should be doing, tried and tested methods that go back hundreds of years, you know, of, of, of quarantining and separation that we know work. So how is it that we navigate that situation? Well, you, you know, it, it's it's also, uh, but but that that is also tied to um, <clears throat> to uh, uh, the the great deal of control uh, uh, that that have uh, uh, big pharma in into this. Okay, the the kind of racket of health care. You know, my partner in, uh, at News Junkie Post, her name is Daddy Sherry, and she's originally from Haiti. And and she's you know I'm not saying that because she's my partner she's absolutely brilliant and she she's a she's a microbiologist okay uh, uh, by trade and uh, and uh, a top microbiologist so she's been she's been uh, uh, writing about the, the 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 virology and the and the science aspect of things on on this from the get go and and there's a, in France. Okay, his name is, is Professor Raoult, Didier Raoult is in, in Marseille. And he came up with the, uh, what became a, a, a big controversy because Trump said at some point that he thought it was a great idea, the, the hydro, hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine treatment uh, with an antibiotic. He came up with a treatment that is actually show result. Okay, it has shown results in Africa and all over the world, including in France. But, however, uh, because it's almost free, it's a medication that's been around for 80 years. Uh, the the uh, the big pharma has been trying to prevent this from going on and and calling him a charlatan among other people. You see, so. There's money involved in this too, you know. Unfortunately, uh, uh, there's money also involved in, um, you know. I mean, there, there, there's definitely an article that you should read uh, from from uh, Daddy Cherie that we published a, a couple of, 
I believe it was three days ago, uh, uh, about the 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 kind of well, what's kind of the controversy right now about the the way the the uh, you know the pandemic started and and if it was uh, uh, from genetic manipulation at Wuhan in that in that top top uh, security supposed to be top security a zone for a lab or if it was on some wet market uh, uh, from either bat or pangolin okay so anyway uh, uh, and uh, it seems according to 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 Daddy Sherry, but it's not only according to her it's according to a bunch of papers she's been reviewing a scientific paper that is from from Indian scientists and and a French Nobel Prize winner. His name is uh, uh, Luc Montagnier. That to to make to make the the story very short because I'm not you know uh, I, I'm not I'm not a scientist you know I'm a I'm a I'm a med school dropout uh, ages ago and at the time you know uh, biology was you know sort of you know, uh, uh, extremely ru- rudimentary. But it's, it appears that the, uh, uh, they inserted a small sequence of HIV virus in a coronavirus in the lab, in this group. And the, the theory, and, and I think it's the true theory, the more I think about it, it's accidentally somebody who was doing the test got contaminated okay so uh but what what uh, daddy exposed is a web of of um, basically cover up and lie from all over the world because the wuhan lab in question okay zone four was actually set up by the french it was built by two French architects. In uh, this has been going on for like 20 years. Okay, they, they work with Institut Pasteur in France. They also work with top U.S. university, uh, Harvard, one in Galveston, Texas, and so on and so on. So basically, um, those claims are likely to be true. Okay, now. One question here, and this is the real question. That's when we, I don't know if you recall a movie called The Island of Dr. Moreau. That's when we, we get into the Island of Dr. Moreau territory. Now, was this deliberately made for, let's say, and that's just an hypothesis, two case scenario, try to do a vaccine for HIV, for AIDS, or biological warfare okay so uh and you know what we cannot discount any of this because some of those people that call themselves scientists are so depraved and it's not it's some from today it's been going on for a long long time the u.s in the 50s were infected population in Guatemala with syphilis, okay, to do tests, to test drugs, okay? Uh, So it's been going on. It's been going on, so it could be that. And in that case, it's almost like uh, we opened, the, the, the Pandora's box was open in Wuhan, okay? Uh, So or they're going to uh, try to cover it up or use it for political gain because that, that's kind of the problem. The problem is, okay, we have a health issue, which, which should be, okay, we need to try to save life. What is the current way to save life? And that is where able politicians like Angela Merkel in, it, in Germany can be, uh, you know, people can give her kudos because she knows how to run a country. So you try to save life, okay? That's healthcare issue. But then it's all that sort of information and disinformation and, and, and the way it's used for capital gain and all this, this sort of level of corruption within science. 
Right, because when we, with this situation, as we see with any situation, we see that those who are in power try to turn the situation to their own profit. And so there, there are times where, well, there are always times where they are being opportunists and there are times where they are also orchestrating, but sometimes they're only just being opportunists. Well, uh, uh, Calibre, you, you're perfectly right. But again, you know, the, the, the motto of, of, of capitalism was and always has been profit of a people. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, people can, can die, can be, can be crushed. Uh, 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 their flesh, their bones can be used for anything. Profit, that's the only thing that matters, the bottom line. And this is what has to be stopped for the sake of humanity. Well, not just for humanity, but for the, for the sake of a, a livable planet at this point. Absolutely. So you use this term eco-socialism to describe... As, as sort of a heading for how to, how to approach our situation and how to move from here. And I'm interested in this term eco-socialism because it seems like the eco needs to be added in front of the word socialism because it isn't necessarily part of socialism in its origination, in, in, in socialism's origination. Oh yeah, yeah, no, totally, absolutely. Because the thing is, you know, it's the, the the that's what I was I was saying about 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 Marxism and, and Karl Marx. Uh, Karl Marx was uh, uh, completely has to be understood in the context of of the Industrial Revolution, in the context of of, of when when uh, 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 young boys of like 13, 14 years old were sent into mine in the in the UK and in in France. You know, the, all the, all this notion of proletariat and all this. Well, that doesn't exist anymore. So that's why we need to have uh, uh, the echo. Uh, uh, which of course stands for ecology in, in, in front of it all. It, it's, it's, it's sort of sharing, sharing, which is the principle of socialism, which is really that everybody should have the same thing. What, whatever they do, okay, that is really the principle of it. Meaning, okay, uh, you, uh, let's say, you you an engineer, uh, you an MD, you don't make more money or a, a lot more money at least than somebody that uh, is a car mechanic. Okay, that that that's the principle. Okay, uh, needless to say, uh, uh, system have not have not functioned like that except in Cuba under Fidel Castro. Uh, and, and, and China and the Mao Zedong, uh, uh, for, for a very, very long time. Uh, um, you know, um, but what I'm saying is, uh, we have, uh, we have a, a social equality emergency and, and, and we have a climate emergency to deal with. And we need to deal it, to deal with that. In, in, in sort of, of conjunction. And we also have another situation, which is uh, overpopulation, but that is directly uh, linked to the notion of, uh, of economic growth, which is also a disaster. You know, but that's, for example, is not a notion that Marxism would have uh, uh, pointed out, you know, uh, uh, Marx didn't have any issue with economic growth. He had the issue with sharing the the, the wealth. Okay, uh, I have issue with the notion that e economic growth is a good thing. I have issue uh, with population growth, major issues. Okay, um, so because it's all about it's all about consumption. It's, it's all about, for, for, for a capitalist system, it's all about consumption. And of course, you need people to buy stuff. 
you need people to buy stuff. They don't need, but you, you buy stuff and you have more people. Therefore, you have less biodiversity, less natural habitat, more people to feed, uh, uh, you know, because there will be, and it's coming, the famine, the famine of climate change, uh, of the climate crisis will come. It will be billions of people that are starving, you know. Uh, I mentioned that before, uh, Jakarta in Indonesia, which is a city of 10 million people, will be underwater within probably five years, okay? Uh, so... Uh, we have we have created. Uh, I'm I'm talking about as as a species. Uh, we have created a, a huge a huge bloody mess. Yes, we certainly have. <laughs> you um, mentioned the Green New Deal before, and and rightly pointed out that it is far too limited the way it's been presented by the Democrats. Are you familiar with the original Green New Deal, though, as formulated by the Green Party uh, and uh, Howie Hawkins, their current candidate, being one of the authors of it? The original Green New Deal actually called for a 50 percent cut in military spending, for example, which the Democrats did not include. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I, what, I, what I'm calling for is, is, is not a 50 percent cut. I'm calling for a 100 percent cut. You see, the Green New Deal to me is irritating because I believe it's the, it's the title of the new book of Naomi Klein. Okay, uh, 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 let me tell you a little story here about Naomi Klein. Uh, uh, Naomi Klein wrote a, a book, I believe, the book that put on on the map that was called the Shock Doctrine, right? In which book she exploited a notion uh, that a term that I actually coined. Uh, right after Katrina, which is the term disaster capitalism. So, to me, be aware, the, the real left, okay, worldwide, should be aware of Naomi Klein. Aware of Naomi Klein, for, not, not for that reason. Plagiarism, uh, it happens all the time. Uh, but the notion that she works and publish a work for neoliberal outlets that are supposed to be on the left, like The Guardian in the UK. The Guardian is not a lefty publication. It's a status quo neoliberal publication. People need to understand that. I think from the viewpoint of U.S. corporate media, The Guardian can seem very liberal somehow. It's an illusion, Colibri. Well, that's a good thing for, for me to hear, uh, and I'm sure for other people to hear, too. No, I mean, the thing is, okay, we need to have, you know, uh, we need to have a global movement here. We need to have a global movement with people, people that, that uh, 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 mean, that say what they mean, that have some kind of plan, and that are not in it for themselves, for either accolade or, or, or making tons of money selling books that are actually genuine and care about uh, uh, collective good. And I think that, I hope I'm not being naive or, or overly optimistic, but I feel like it's, it's part of human nature to want to, to cooperate and work together towards the common good in that kind of way. Yeah, yeah, Colibri, I hear you. I, I, I want to hear you, but it's also unfortunately part of human nature when you, when you have, a, uh, and, and even some kids, when, when let's say you bring a pie or, the, or, or a yummy cake on the, on the table, there's always going to be someone that's going to, to, to want more and, and hurt stuff, you know. And that's the capitalist in the world, you see. Oh, the selfish person in the room, the, the, the person that just want more than others. Right. And those are the people who seem to be in charge of the system right now. But that's the problem, you see. That's the problem. So how much of our current structure needs to go in order to move forward in 
in a way that actually is healthy for people and the planet? Well, what, what we need to do, Caribri, and, 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 and you and I, we try. I mean, there's a bunch of the, uh, the people like uh, Sam Mitchell from the Collapse Chronicle. There's a bunch of people that try, that you share, of course, uh, do it all the time. They, they, I mean, I, uh, the list is, is too long to, to, to name, but we need to sort of try to uh, 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 reset the narrative away from uh, what is noise, what is uh, politic du spectacle, uh, uh, politic du spectacle, and that's what we have. And and it's not only in the U.S. It's everywhere, uh, Colibri. It's not about... It, it's, it's about uh, perception of things. Well... Perception is one thing, but there's a notion that should be behind everything, which is reality and common good. Okay, you you in in the case of France, you you compare somebody like Emmanuel Macron, which is the darling, by the way, darling of the world, you know, a darling of neoliberalism because he's young, modern. And Blah, 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 sort of metrosexual, whatever. It doesn't <laughs> matter to me. Uh, 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 anyway, just like Justin Trudeau, uh, if you know what I'm saying. Yes. Anyway, no matter, it doesn't matter, okay? Uh, no difference whatsoever. You compare him with people, of course, like General de Gaulle or even Jacques Chirac. Well, it's like comparing apple to oranges. Jacques Chirac had the cojones, and I'm saying that because it's Cinco de Mayo, to oppose George W. Bush uh, for his little war in Iraq. Okay, uh, People do, do not remember that. It was in, in 2003. I'm sure most people have, uh, have forgotten that. But he did. Okay, uh, Macron wouldn't do that. Uh, and you have somebody like uh, the very colorful uh, uh, Boris Johnson, sort of like the mini Trump, the mini Trump of the UK, sort of like the, you know, Tom Poodle or, or whatever. Uh, uh, and he wrote a book. He used to be a journalist, not a bad one, actually. He, he wrote a book on Winston Churchill, but you take Boris Johnson and Winston Churchill and it's, Night and days, okay? Uh, again, they used to be political leaders, for better or worse. People that actually made decisions, and they made decisions, the good one, for the collective good of their country. I wonder sometimes if part of the difference between now and previous decades not just in our leadership, but also in the energy being put forward uh, by our, our institutions, our other institutions and our population itself, is just the fact that at this point, the U.S. is historically in the phase that one would call an empire in decline. And so being that it's an empire in decline, it really just lacks the juice at this point, so to speak, to be able to embark upon anything like that? It's been in decline for a long time. As a matter of fact, I was one of the first ones to point that out, uh, Colibri, in 2010, to be precise. I wrote an article called uh, uh, The American Empire uh, uh, is, uh, um, uh, is Collapsing and America Will Be the Last to Know. Okay. Uh, 2010, 10 years ago, exactly. It's been declining for a long time. Empire declined for internal reason and external reason. Both of them are there. Keep in mind that the empire and NATO were not able to defeat a bunch of Pashtun in Afghanistan since 2001. A bunch of Pashtun with IED and Kalashnikov. Well, that's not a great empire, is it? 
No, no, it's not. And so that's the external part. And so internally, obviously, the empire has been in decline in many ways uh, for a while. I mean, economically, I think the United States peaked in, what, the late 60s, early 70s. That's right. That's right. And, and, and socially, too. Socially, too. The very first time I came to the U.S., Colibri, was under Jimmy Carter, which is a president I really like. And it was in 1977. And this country was a lot better in, in all kind of senses. It was actually better, not that I was around, but it was better uh, uh, even during Dwight Eisenhower, who, who was, by the way, a Republican and also a warrior. At the time, at the time, during the 60s and the 70s, a man that worked on the assembly line for GM of Ford in Detroit, Michigan, he was able to buy a house. His wife didn't have to work. Uh, and, of course, he was able to buy uh, and drive a car as well, you know, on one salary. Now, that would be absolutely impossible. And at the time, that was possible mostly for white workers and not nearly as much to the same degree to black workers. Of course. Of course. But you see, you see an empire that doesn't manufacture anything, uh, get the stuff manufactured elsewhere, and the profits go into corporation, only like a corporate headquarters are here, okay? They, they benefit from it. Uh, 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 that is not stable. An empire that have his entire infrastructure on the verge of collapse, that is not stable. An empire that only manufacture a uh, weapon and, and, and span, uh, what is it, what's the budget now, uh, 800 billion official budget to the Pentagon every year and cannot even defeat a bunch of Pashtuns. Now, is it worthwhile in terms of investment? I'm not talking about even about the morality of the war, which, of course, doesn't exist. But it, in terms of investment, you invest, okay, $800 billion a year to win wars in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Iraq, because there's still war going on in Iraq, and you can't win them. No, is that, is that a worthwhile investment? No. It is not for the taxpayer, but for Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, for all those people, it is. You see? Yes. But you see, the problem, the problem here, it's a global, it's a global corporate empire, okay? Uh, people that pretend to be populist, like Trump or, or Boris Johnson, they don't really care. Uh, uh, because it's it, all the all the all the financial markets are tied together. They know that. They they're just saying that to amuse the 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 people. They they're not per se uh, uh, they're not per se nationalists. Maybe some people that advise them are, but they're not. They understand very well. Uh, I mean, maybe some of them are slightly retarded, but the people like the the head of the treasury mentioned we used to be at Goldman Sachs, he understands very well that, well, the wheel has to be greased and, and, and you know, they have to work with China and, and so on and so on, you know. Yeah. So there's at once people who know what, who, who know how the system works and are trying to, to, to keep their wealth intact. And then at the same time, there seems to be an increasing level of uh, stupidity involved as, as well. That's right. That's right. But look, Colibri, to sum it up, I would say that the political class, okay, who appears to be elected, and they are elected, but there's just no good options, okay, uh, because it's designed that way. And it's not only in the U.S., I repeat, is actually at the service of what I identified earlier as the billionaire class, which is about 2,000 individuals worldwide, Okay. 2,000 individuals. Yes, 2,019 to be precise. Billionaire. This is a small number of people, and I'm sure you're familiar with the Utah Phillips quotation about how it's not that the earth is dying, it's being killed, and it's being killed by a certain number of people, and we know their names and their addresses. That's right. But the, those people, as I said, they control 60% 
of the world wealth, 6-0%. Right. Okay? This is not fair, but of course, but further than that, this is not sustainable. This is worse than feudalism. Okay? Yes, the level of inequality between a modern CEO and their lowest paid worker is a greater level of inequality than existed in feudal England between a serf and the king. That's right. You cannot, you cannot have this kind of the, the type of concentration of wealth. This is not something that can last. It, it never did in history. There's always a breaking point. Louis the Sixteenth in France didn't see it coming. It came. Uh, uh, the, the Romanov in Russia in 1917, they didn't see it coming. It came and so on and so on. And so there's that possibility that exists now, too, because while this pandemic is going on, they're using it as an excuse to try to gain more control and exert more power, yet at the same time, it is a time of a, a moment of, of weakness or where they can be said to be off balance, I believe. Uh, they're completely off balance because the universe is collapsing. So they, they're trying to turn the screw. They, they keep turning the screw, but they are off balance because they don't clearly understand. And they, they are sort of like navigating uh, uh, you know, without a compass, Colibri, no right. compass. Right. And, 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 you know, they've forgotten not to use the stars, you know, great navigators in the, 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 the Viking or the, or the navigator from French Polynesia, they use stars. They could navigate using stars. Those, those bozos cannot use anything. So at this point, the very last thing that we should be seeking is a, quote, return to normal, because that would only be going back to a situation that benefits them and hurts us. That's right. But the thing is, the, the, I really truly think that, that, that we have reached, and I've used that term, I think, for the first time on, 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 uh, on, on Sam Mitchell's show, on the Collapse Chronicle, uh, uh, one of the Collapse Chronicles I did with them about that. I think we are in a zone of paradigm shift, of, of, of historical and social paradigm shift. And I think that COVID-19 has sort of worked as a catalyst in that. Okay, uh, uh, People are familiar with paradigm shift. They're familiar with it mainly in science, uh, uh, you know, uh, E, e, e equal M, mc square was a scientific paradigm sh uh, shift. Okay, uh, 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 unfortunately, uh, and and uh, you know Albert Einstein was very very sorry about this, and he actually wrote the most touching uh, essay about that. That eventually uh, is wonderful. The the, the rel rel relativity uh, uh, discovery. Uh, uh, down the line, made able uh, to uh, produce nuclear weapon. Okay, so he he was completely uh, he was very very down about the Manhattan Project and all this uh, uh, horrible things that were used from him. But that was, however, a scientific paradigm shift. What I'm talking about here is is slightly different, and it's the, it's historical and sociological paradigm shift. Okay, the French Revolution was an historical paradigm shift. Okay, now in terms of where we're going, I, you know, of course, you know, nobody can predict it. It's going to be pretty much the way people react and the way people, uh, uh, the way, the way the energy. Uh, the, if there's a synergy because between people like people like you and I, people that that sort of uh, think the same way, or at least in, in in very close proximity, then we could have. And I'm talking about worldwide because, of course, to deal with a global system that is corrupt and and completely exploitative and and rely on exploitation of resources and people, it needs to be a global movement against that. If that can happen, then perhaps 
this paradigm shift can go. Uh, the people, the political class and the billionaire class are living right now in the opposite of paradigm shift, which is paradigm paralysis, which is basically they cannot let it go. They, they live in the reality of before the pandemic, okay? Um, and they think, I think that what they want and they think they think that they can go back to what they call normal, which was not normal, by doing the only thing that they know or to do, which is throwing money at a problem, money that do not belong to them and money that they don't have, money that they're printing. Right. So part of what we need to do then as individuals, well, and as the people of the world who are not the 2,000 billionaires, is to avoid that paralysis in ourselves, in our own thinking, and in our own actions, and to be seeking that shift instead. Absolutely. I mean, basically, what, 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 what you know, whomever's going to listen to this podcast, uh, uh, I, I would like, if, if, if I could, I, w I would like to give, give them a sense of actually a sense of optimism because the, we had the crisis. This is not the, the, the COVID-19 uh, 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 tragedy, and it's always a tragedy when you have, like, uh, I mean, it's very likely that when, when it's all done, uh, uh, there's going to be 300, more than 300,000 people uh, dead or, or 500 uh, uh, who knows? That's a tragedy. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to 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 uh, uh, dismiss that. But if all those victims and all the people that have suffered from them, they they their relative, they their friends, they, and so on, their lovers, uh, 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 can uh, at least get the notion that. The sort of the sort of sacrifice would have not come for nothing. Then, then it could be a good thing. I often wonder if the leadership, the people, bottom-up leadership, that needs to lead this, or the only one that can, would be a leadership that does not come from the United States or even Europe at all, but actually from the rest of the world, from the global south, that it is more likely for an uprising to come from there than from here? Well, it can come from, from a bunch of different places at the same time. And it, and it, and it, it can be, it doesn't have to, to follow any, any, any historical model per se, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be like uh, there's going to be guillotine in the street and so on and so on, you know. I... I, I I've done several shows on a, on a great little radio station in South Africa, in Johannesburg. It's called, it's called Salam Media, and uh, uh, his host name is Inayat Wadi, and it's wonderful. And, and it, you know, there's a lot of synergy. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, there there is, uh, uh, Colibri, there is actually more synergy than probably you think. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there is. I feel as though... I don't have enough of a sense for what's going on around the world. And I feel as though, ironically enough, in this Internet age, it's actually not so easy to find that information and that, and that news. Well, yeah, but the thing is, it's like it's 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 all about to me. It's all about putting putting energy into it and. And, and, and trying to find people uh, uh, who think the same way and, and trying to convince people, uh, uh, which is not necessarily easy, sort of into uh, the validity of, the, of, this, of this narrative. This narrative being that this is a, an opportunity as much as, a, well, more than it is a tragedy, even. It's a huge opportunity, Corrie a huge opportunity. Because in reality, in reality, the world, the world, the way it was organized was in deep crisis, and it had been in deep crisis for a very long time. 
Right. Well, in a sense, it's been in a, an acute crisis uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and a chronic crisis since the Neolithic Revolution. That's why. I wanted to read one more thing that you wrote here and, and have you react to it if you'd like to uh, as a way of closing out the show. And here's the quotation. It's from something you wrote on the last week or so. You said... The coronavirus is a lesson in humility. It will, perhaps, give our species the opportunity to reinvent itself and that way dodge a looming collapse. And so I was just wondering if you could talk about the humility and the looming collapse there. Well, humility is very simple. Uh, uh, you know, it's like... People, you, you know, like half of the planet is, is like in lo lockdown confinement. So some, some of us are alone. Some of us are in, in, in couple or with the children. And as a matter of fact, some couple have been having a lot of issues. So people are dealing with their own, uh, uh, people are dealing with their own psyche. And it's very interesting because they're sort of not necessarily used to that, to have to have time to to kind of contemplate uh, things and try to go back to the essential. And the es essential is uh, compassion for others, uh, ethic, morality, respect for the natural world, sort of the way. Uh, Native American indigenous and, and also, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, some, some, uh, some tribes in the, in Africa you used to live ages ago. Uh, so I have this kind of notion that we are, if you wish, that we need to become in harmony again with not, not only with, with the natural world, but with our own society. We sort of re need to redefine, uh, uh, we, we need to redefine what we are, you know, uh, and, and we need to rediscover a sense of, how could I, how could I put it? A sense of, of grounding, a sense of joy, I mean, to me, to me, the people that claim all those people, evangelical, what, what not, and, and uh, creationists, uh, or, or you know, uh, Islamist fundamentalists or whatever, they they're not really they they don't even understand the 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 good of 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 the religion that they they're supposed to be embracing, okay, uh, uh, because. One of the reasons why Christianity was so successful during the Roman world, okay, and Islam was successful as well, is precisely this notion of compassion, this notion of morality, this notion of sharing, okay? Uh, and this doesn't have to be applied, again, I'm not agnostic, it doesn't have to be applied in any sort of, of, of um, uh, religious context. I mean, Native Americans used to worship uh, uh, animals and plants, you know. Um, we need to rediscover that. We need to, we need to rediscover in terms of farming, we need to rediscover polyculture. Uh, uh, we need to, we need to think a lot smaller. We need to uh, not think, oh, I'm going to go on a cruise or I'm going to go fly uh, 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 to such and, and such places. No, that should not be something that we should be doing. I absolutely agree. Uh, simplify seems like a good way of summing up a lot of what you just said. We, we have to go philosophically. We, we need to, oh, each, each of one of us has to try to go back to the essence of, my, of what makes what make their life, their own life. Not mine. I know what makes my life valuable. 
I, I'm a person of, 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 of words, and that, that's what I do. It was not always like that, but that's what I do. What makes their own life worthwhile and valuable? It's an opportunity. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for kind of self-discovery and reflection. It's sort of a two, couple of months of, of, of a kind of a, a first vacation from everything. It's kind of, you open, you open, COVID-19 open a parenthesis and, and well, it, it's, it's going to close whenever it's going to close, you know. Yeah, and it's too early to know now when that is. That's right. Thank you so much for joining me today, Gilbert. I was really enjoyed our conversation, and I'd like to have you on again some other time. Yeah, Cody Breed was wonderful. Uh, it was really uh, my my pleasure, uh, uh, my my pleasure to be on this podcast. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast, and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri. K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.